um, today uh, everywhere in the world uh, is Ash Wednesday, but here and in Milan, the celebration continues with uh, uh, another uh, talk in our um, high energy theory uh, research talks. Uh, we are happy to have Grant uh, Remen from uh, the Kavli Institute at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He will talk about effective field theory and the fate of charged black holes. Thank you. Please start. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Massimo, for the uh, kind introduction and uh, for the great invitation to be able to speak to you all. Uh, so, right. So today we'll be talking about charged black holes and more broadly, the contours of uh, the effective field theory of photons and gravitons that constitutes the, the low energy uh, theory described universe and what black holes can uh, can tell us about that theory. So just to put this in context, uh, I, in my research, I work in uh, sort of a broad array of different uh, topics spanning everything from particle physics all the way to string theory and using techniques from both quantum gravity and quantum field theory. And this talk will cover roughly sort of this uh, region of, of my work, uh, bounding the laws of physics using uh, infrared reasoning uh, that's relatively UV agnostic. In, in this talk, I'll be applying that, as I said, to photon graviton effective field theory, but these, some of these techniques generalize to all sorts of other interesting effective field theories, including uh, the standard model uh, effective field theory, which is of phenomenological interest. Uh, so just a few words about the space of EFTs. Uh, so how do we build a quantum field theory? Well, if you, if you crack open your favorite uh, QFT textbook, uh, you'll learn how to, you know, given the Lagrangian, uh, built out of some operators and some couplings, how to just canonically quantize it, how to read off the Feynman rules, uh, compute amplitudes, compute cross sections, and all the rest. But interestingly, this process is not guaranteed to create a consistent effective field theory. Not all couplings are allowed. Are certain signs and certain magnitudes of couplings that are forbidden in the sense that they never show up in a healthy uh, ultraviolet complete theory. And we know this uh, dating from this famous paper of Adams et al, but going back to the S matrix program, even of the 1960s, based on techniques uh, involving locality of scattering amplitudes as analyticity, uh, causality, uh, unitarity of quantum mechanics, and other uh, similar IR uh, consistency techniques. And this has been applied to uh, constrain a whole litany of theories uh, of which I've, I've worked on many different theories using these techniques, including Einstein-Maxwell, scalar theories of the standard model, et cetera. And it's even been famously applied uh, to prove the A theorem uh, in four dimensions. But this IR first, this sort of bottom up approach exists in parallel with another top down program of research, uh, the Swampland program in string theory. And what is that? Well, okay, I've, I've told you, in the space of all low energy actions, the space of all EFTs, or the space of all Lagrangians, that is, the space of consistent EFTs is a strict subset of that. And within that lives the string landscape, the set of all possible low energy actions that uh, can be given to you by a consistent uh, string compactification. Now, you've probably heard the famous 10 to the 500 number, people argue about the number, but it's a very large number potentially of possible uh, sets of laws of physics. And it's not tractable to exhaustively enumerate them all. Uh, so people notice patterns and come up with conjectures known as swampland conjectures to uh, sort of delineate the general features of a consistent uh, set of low energy laws of physics that come from string theory and one that does not. Uh, the swampland being the name that we give to the complement of, of the landscape. So what's interesting, though, is that in some places it appears that the boundary of the string landscape can be found and understood using methods that are UV agnostic, that is using purely IR consistency. Um, it's even possible that the yeah, entire sorry, string... Grant. Yes. Can I interrupt? I, I always Please. am worried that I'm not understanding the nuance in people's language here. And okay. you're making the distinction between UV and IR. So could you just carefully say what you mean by strand la string landscape and the complement? Right. Just be okay. sure I understand that mis misunderstanding. Yeah, yeah. No, th uh, thanks for, for raising this question. And in, in, it's actually an interesting uh, sociological point because different people sometimes mean different things uh, with this. So the string landscape here is the set of low energy actions that you can get 
from some string construction. So you put some fluxes uh, on your compact extra dimensions, you compactify down to four dimensions, and you ask, what's the set of laws of physics? What are the forces? What are the particles? Um, there's a large number of possible okay. such Lagrangians. Uh, the Swampland yeah. would be a Lagrangian that okay. can't so, um, be gotten that way. So that's a start, actually, right? David, David, could you mute yourself, please? Sorry, sorry, Grant. Is, is there another question right. or? Well, let me just, uh, so the Swampland is an IR consistent EFT, which is not from the string landscape. Not necessarily. The Swampland, no, the Swampland is just some action, as some Lagrangian that doesn't, uh, the Swampland is the set of all Lagrangians that are not in the landscape. So the Swampland okay. would be like the blue part and the gray part here. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yep. Because this is an open question, is, uh, do, does the blue part even exist? Is there a space of IR consistent EFTs that uh, cannot be gotten from the string landscape? That's, that's something we're still, we're still asking and investigating. Okay, good. Uh, so a final tool that I haven't mentioned um, is black hole thermodynamics. So aside from causality, uh, something that we know, uh, or that we think we know about quantum gravity is how to compute the entropy of a black hole. Uh, this is agnostic about the details of the UV completion. Um, we, you can sort of derive the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy from uh, GR and quantum field theory uh, alone, as Bekenstein and Hawking famously did. And you all know the A over 4G formula. But in, in effective field theory, where the theory isn't just pure Einstein gravity, where you have higher derivative terms in your action, uh, you have to replace the area in the entropy uh, formula with the, the Wald formula uh, discovered by, uh, by Bob Wald in 1993. And you can derive this formula es essentially uniquely using the first law of black hole mechanics. So this is the appropriate generalization of the A over 4G formula in a theory that has higher derivative terms that you got from integrating out some massive fields that live in the UV. So that's, that's just background. But in this talk, we're going, to gather, uh, we're going to bring together these three lines of reasoning. We're going to constrain the operator coefficients in Einstein-Maxwell EFT and find the boundary of the swampland by, by putting together black hole entropy and quantum gravity techniques with ideas from the swampland and ideas from uh, just the IR consistency program in quantum field theory. So uh, next, uh, a few more introductory words about EFTs and the weak gravity conjecture. So in this talk, we'll be, we'll be going beyond the black holes that we encounter in astrophysics. Uh, the, the low energy laws of nature, the Einstein equations and Maxwell's equations uh, have as solutions, various types of spinning and charged uh, electric and magnetic black holes. And these black holes provide a fantastic laboratory that allows us to uh, probe our understanding of uh, par both particle physics and quantum gravity. So we'll be talking about these both charged and spinning uh, black holes, even though they're not the sort of thing you find uh, in the wild. So just as introduction, uh, the Reissner Nordstrom black hole uh, has two horizons. There's an inner horizon and outer horizon. Uh, you have some charge and some mass. And the classical requirement is that Q over M has to be less than one over M Planck. Uh, if Q over M exceeds one in Planck units, then in Einstein-Maxwell theory, uh, you have a naked singularity. The, the horizons disappear. At the extremal point where Q equals M, uh, the two horizons merge. So the black holes we'll be talking about are uh, called Kerr-Newman black holes. So we'll give them some charge Q, some magnetic charge Q tilde. Here I'm just writing them in uh, relativist units, geometrized units. Uh, they have some mass and some spin J. And the extremality parameter, uh, which I'll write as uh, zeta here, uh, zeta equals one for an extremal black hole of some sort, and uh, zeta equals zero for a Schwarzschild black hole. And the zeta less than or equal to one spheroid consists of the, the set of physical black holes. So uh, the metric looks, looks like the following. There's some uh, radius r uh, that describes the horizon. It's a constant radius in, in these particular uh, spheroidal coordinates. And we'll be interested in the outer part of the metric, so the outer horizon and beyond. So we're, we won't care about the details of the interior. So 
the weak gravity conjecture that we'll be concerned with in this talk is, is a statement about quantum gravity. It's a statement that anytime you have some abelian gauge theory, some copy of electromagnetism uh, coupled consistently with quantum gravity, there has to be in the spectrum some state with charge and mass uh, bigger than one in Planck units. So for such a state, it could be a particle. Uh, gravity is the weakest force uh, in the two copies of those uh, states will electrically repel rather than gravitationally attract uh, on balance. So the justification for this uh, originally was uh, based on black hole decay. You can show just by charge and energy conservation that uh, a black hole of charge Q and mass M has to decay to objects with larger charge to mass ratio. So you have to conserve charge, you have to conserve energy, but you have to give some kinetic energy to the decay products in order to have non-zero phase space uh, to dump them into. So the average uh, charge to mass ratio of the decay products is larger. So extreme black hole decay requires the weak gravity conjecture to be true. So if you think about how does a black hole decay, if it's, if it's short shield, it just Hawking radiates away neutral photons and gravitons until it explodes. But if it's a charged black hole, and if, it just, if it's uh, just Hawking, Hawking radiating away neutral stuff, um, it's not losing any charge. So it will get more and more extremal as, as time passes. But if there exists some particle or some lighter state with Q over M bigger than one, it can not only Hawking radiate, it can also swing or pair produce uh, those particles out of vacuum and lose its charge, shed its charge that way. And so that's, that's a nice aspect of what the weak gravity conjecture does for you. Now, this isn't a proof. Uh, you might expect bla that black holes can decay because of the famous pathologies associated with black hole remnants, but I won't be talking about those in this talk. Um, a, similar, a similar statement applies for spinning black holes, except for spinning black holes, you can always shed your spin by dumping, uh, by dumping angular momentum into just the orbital angular momentum of the decay products. But interestingly, if there is a single particle with large j, with uh, j over m bigger than the j over m of the black hole, you can uh, also shed angular momentum by decaying directly to those objects at rest with respect to each other without using orbital angular momentum. So it's a similar sort of story. So let me just define the EFT that, uh, that we'll be working with. So it's an Einstein-Maxwell effective field theory. So let me write the leading order action as L bar, which is just the Einstein-Hilbert term plus the Maxwell term. And then delta L will be higher derivative stuff that we get by integrating out states in the UV. So this is actually what the laws of nature in our universe are at really low energies if you integrate out all the massive particles. So for example, uh, you could consider the leading four derivative terms, which would be things like r squared or rf squared or f to the fourth. But for most of this talk, I'll, I'll actually be being much more general than this. And this is just an example to keep in the back of your mind. So what does adding these terms uh, do? Well, it modifies uh, the Einstein and Maxwell equations. There will be deformations to the equations of motion. There'll be small deformations uh, because we'll be working within the regime of validity of the EFT. But what this means is that the metrics uh, for the black hole, uh, g mu nu, get changed a little bit. Uh, they change to g, mu, to g mu nu plus some delta g mu nu. And if the black hole obeys a different space-time geometry, that means the extremality bound might be different. The, the zeta, the, the q over m ratio uh, corresponding to an extremal black hole might not be one anymore. It might be something different, one plus delta zeta. So we want to compute delta zeta and say something about its sign under these uh, corrections that come from states in the UV. So indeed, the, the, the corrections could go one way or the other. Uh, so here I've plotted uh, zeta versus m. So in pure Einstein-Maxwell theory, all the physical black holes live below the, the dotted line at one. But when you add these higher derivative terms, uh, the line could go either way. It could either be above or below that dotted line. And if it's above, what you get is something remarkable. You get that large black holes, large charged black holes, can decay to directly to smaller charged black holes because they have slightly larger Q over M 
ratio, which can in turn decay to yet smaller ones. So the entire tower of erstwhile exactly stable extremal black holes in the theory collapses down all the way down to the scale of the UV completion where the EFT breaks down. So if you can show that delta zeta is positive, then you find that black holes themselves satisfy the weak gravity conjecture. So this tells you in a fundamental sense why gravity has to be the weakest force if you can prove that delta zeta uh, is positive. And so that's what we'll be discussing uh, in the rest of this talk. So this will be based on both uh, previous work with Cliff Chung and Jun Yu Lu, and also uh, current work with uh, Nima Arkani Hamed and, uh, and Yutin Wang. Okay, can, my, uh, oh, sorry. Yes, sorry, please. Go ahead. So, a couple of questions. First, I thought that there, in original papers, actually, Nima et al. argued that this lightest state should be actually not a black hole. That was a part of the with gravity conjecture, but I might be wrong. Another question, oh, because this yeah. argument, which initially you, about Q over M, it can be applied also to magnetic charge. So, does oh, yeah. it provide different bound on the uh, uh, high dimensional operators from the, the ones which you get from electric yes. charge? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so the bounds on the Wilson coefficients themselves, uh, the the, you know, in this example, for example, the bounds on the C one through C eight are different from a magnetic black hole versus an electric black hole. So you actually get the strongest bounds by marginalizing over all possible dionic black holes, uh, which is what I'll do at the end of the talk. So absolutely. Um, regarding uh, regarding the state. Um, there are several versions of the weak gravity conjecture uh, that they actually give in the original paper. Like, should Q over M lightest be bigger than one, or should uh, you know max Q over M be bigger than one? And the weak version of the weak gravity conjecture, the version that you just need by requiring black hole decay, is that uh, max Q over M is bigger than one, agnostic about M. So it could be that this isn't monotonic. For example, if this, you know, I've suggestively dotted the line here up to particles, but if it like turned over, for example, you would have a pile up at some, uh, at some energy scale, uh, which would be okay though, from the point of view of, you know, black hole remnants. You'd only have a black hole remnant at a single mass. You wouldn't have an infinite tower. So uh, from that point of view, it's fine. But yeah, that's a good question. Right, I was actually gonna ask about the monoticity of that, of that line, so. Right. Okay, good. So now what I want to do is uh, connect all these ideas and uh, prove a really sort of shocking relationship between uh, the black hole's energy, that is its extremality parameter, its entropy, and the on-shell action itself. So that's, that's what we'll do now. Um, and again, this will apply for any uh, delta L, not just the four derivative ones I gave as an example. So I'm gonna connect delta zeta to the black hole entropy. So what I wanna do is compute the black hole's entropy in two different situations. One is uh, the kind of Bayer theory L bar, just pure Einstein Maxwell without higher derivative terms. So it's a black hole with some mass, some electric and magnetic charge and some angular momentum. And I wanna compare it to the entropy in a theory uh, L, which is L bar plus these higher derivative terms with the same asymptotic charges. So we measure asymptotic charge using ADM quantities at infinity so the delta L doesn't really affect how one computes those quantities. So same macro state, if you will, but uh, different, different theory. So in the theory on the right, uh, there are massive states that we integrated out. So you might expect uh, the entropy difference between the two theories, S minus S bar, to be positive, but we won't assume that yet. It's just some entropy difference. So in the theory on the left, uh, the entropy is just uh, the area over 4G, where the area is just dictated by the Einstein and Maxwell equations. In the case on the right, uh, there are two changes to the entropy. One is that, well, the entropy isn't just A over 4G, it's given by Wald's formula, as I said previously. But an additional change is that even the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy isn't the same in the theory on the right, because the radius of the black hole is different. The area is different because it obeys slightly different equations of motion. So we have to take both effects into account. All right, so we wanna compute delta S, the shift in the walled entropy. And for now, uh, let me work in a grand canonical ensemble at fixed T and omega rather than fixed M and J. So omega here is uh, just the black hole uh, rotational velocity. So the inverse temperature beta defines a periodicity in Euclidean time for the Euclidean path integral. 
uh, e to the minus beta g, where g is uh, the Gibbs free energy associated with this ensemble. So this is uh, sort of traditional 80s style uh, Euclidean quantum gravity that we're using here. And I is going to be our Euclidean action. All right, so expanding beta G, expanding this free energy uh, as Rial and Santos did in, in this recent paper, I can write beta G in terms of some other quantities plus delta S, but this isn't quite the delta S that I want. This is delta S at fixed T and omega. And the delta S that I defined a couple slides ago is delta S at fixed M and J, at fixed charges. So what I need to do is reparameterize delta S. Well, we can do that straightforwardly. And we can recognize these terms in parentheses as just the inverse temperature and beta omega by the first law of black hole mechanics. So we can rewrite uh, the shift in beta G at fixed T and omega as the shift in delta S that we want up to a sign. Furthermore, using the SMA relation that beta G equals uh, the Euclidean action implies that delta S indeed equals minus delta Euclidean action, uh, where the right-hand side is evaluated on the Euclideanized Kerr-Newman solution. But then there's, there's a wonderful additional uh, fact we can use, which is that uh, the T coordinate is a killing vector for Kerr-Newman. So uh, wick rotating it is, is simple. And the on-shell Euclidean action is just beta times the on-shell Lorentzian action. So you take the delta L, the higher derivative operators, you just plug in the uncorrected Kerr-Newman solution, the Lorentzian Kerr-Newman solution, and integrate over a space-like slice at constant T outside the horizon. Multiply it by one over the temperature, and you've got uh, your shift in entropy. Good. So now we want to relate this to the shift in the extremality parameter. So we can do that by taking a closer look at Wald's formula. So expanding the entropy and looking at uh, each term separately, the first term here, uh, L bar times A bar, just yields the standard uh, Bekenstein Hawking entropy. Sorry, what is epsilon? Oh, epsilon is the epsilon mu nu is the binormal to the horizon. Uh, it's it's just a matrix that uh, that picks out the t and r uh, uh, directions. Good. Okay, so this, uh, this first term just picks out, uh, if you compute it, the standard Bekenstein Hawking entropy. The second term is, we can call it an interaction contribution. It's the explicit uh, functional difference to the entropy uh, caused by the extra terms in Wald's formula. So I'll call that delta SI. And this third term is the other term I mentioned earlier, the horizon contribution, the shift in area uh, that comes from the changed equations of motion that this black hole is obeying with fixed charge. So it's just delta A over 4G. So let me first compute uh, that horizon contribution to the entropy. So in boyer lindquist coordinates, the Kerr-Newman black hole uh, has area given by 4 pi RH squared plus A squared. And so under a shift, a small shift in the horizon radius, delta A goes just like delta RH. So how do we locate the new horizon? Uh, we have the horizon condition. We require that the inverse RR component of the metric vanishes, which allows us to find the event horizon for a, for a stationary geometry like we have. And then we expand. Now I can write this in terms of the old RR component of the metric, plus the shift, the functional shift, plus uh, the shift in radius times the radial derivative, plus the shift in zeta times the zeta derivative. Now, in principle, I could worry about angular derivatives or even derivatives with respect to this uh, spin parameter, A over RH, but you can show that those all vanish. Moreover, this, this uh, G bar RR vanishes by just the pure Kerr-Newman horizon condition, because remember, I'm evaluating, I'm evaluating the entire right-hand side on the Kerr-Newman solution. Now, when I'm holding the charges fixed, uh, this last term, the D zeta term, vanishes uh, by definition. So the horizon shift is just minus delta GRR over the R derivative of the old metric. Now the interaction contribution, the explicit wall type terms were regular in the extremal limit. Whereas this goes singular in the extremal limit because uh, the R derivative uh, vanishes when the two horizons uh, become degenerate. So this means that in the extremal limit, uh, the overall shift in entropy is dominated by this horizon shift term. And we can write delta S uh, in terms of delta GRR and its radial derivative. Good, 
but we don't yet know GRR, delta GRR because we haven't solved uh, the corrected, the deformed Einstein and Maxwell equations. But we actually don't have to solve them. Uh, we just can relate them to delta zeta. So let me locate uh, the new extremality condition. So here, uh, I'm allowing the charges to shift because I want to find out what's the new Q over M bound to not have a naked singularity. But the radial uh, derivative vanishes on the exact extremal condition, just by definition. So the extremality shift, delta zeta, again, goes like delta G R R, only divided by the zeta derivative, not the R derivative. So we can put this all together and we can relate delta zeta to delta S, which we previously related to delta L. And we have this amazing relationship that the shift in uh, charge to mass or even spin to mass ratio is just given by uh, T delta S, which is just given by the integral of the Euclidean, or excuse me, the integral of the Lorentzian action, the higher derivative action evaluated on the old Kernuman solution, the old spinning black hole. And um, I should mention uh, Quantum Magazine actually was uh, interested in this, uh, in this relationship we found in uh, last year, mid last year. So uh, it's, it's really kind of, they, they, they characterize it as a fundamental link between energy and order, which is just a fancy way. It's a fundamental link between black hole entropy and the shift in, uh, in charge to mass ratio. So this is what we're gonna be using uh, to actually compute things. So, uh, I next want to argue for why, uh, why should you believe that the action is positive? See, if, if delta L is strictly positive, then delta zeta is strictly positive, and we have the weak gravity conjecture plus of other results about spinning black holes. So I want to motivate why uh, you should think delta L uh, is positive based on unitarity and causality. So as I said, unitarity and causality often imply positivity of the higher dimension operators of delta L itself in well-defined UV completions. So here's an example for why, why that happens. So for operators that start at quartic order in the field, so for uh, operators whose UV completions don't mess with the kinetic terms of the, of the light states, uh, one can generically write a completion of some operator J squared uh, via coupling to some possibly multi-particle state chi by just chi times j times some coupling. So here, this looks like I'm just integrating out a scalar at tree level, but this is much more general. Chi could be uh, the cut of some loop. So if you imagine uh, I have some multi-photon operator that's generated by uh, integrating out some charged matter at one loop, I could take a cut through of that loop on shell, and then chi would be like an, uh, an electron positron state. Now, you can write a uh, chilean lehmann representation for the two-point function or the two-current function. And while this is standard technology for, uh, for scalars or at, at tree level, this actually, you can show, even applies uh, for loops, where here rho is a positive definite density of states. And so you can formally integrate out the massive state to just get the delta L will go like g squared times j squared times some uh, log-weighted integral uh, of the mass times this density of states. So unitarity requires that the spectral density is positive. It's just a sum over uh, the squares of a bunch of inner products uh, of states. And the absence of tachyons requires that we're integrating over mu uh, strictly positive. And as I said, this applies to loops as well. So this is sort of what you should have in the back of your mind for why uh, we expect delta L to be positive. And in fact, causality often additionally uh, requires convexity of the action. It, it requires even more. So if you take, for example, a P of X theory, where X is D phi squared, uh, causality implies that uh, P double prime is, is positive. So it's, it's convex in field space. And this applies even beyond uh, the effective field theory regime. In, uh, in the Euler-Heisenberg action, uh, which one obtains by integrating out charged matter at one loop, you have an entire tower uh, beyond Maxwell. So Maxwell gives you the F squared term, but you get F to the fourth terms uh, through this diagram, but I could continue attaching photons and I would get F to the sixth, F to the eight, et cetera. Uh, this huge tower in, uh, in, in the gauge field term. And you can resum, uh, resum this tower and evaluate what, uh, what is the on-shell action even at, at magnetic fields that are much, much larger uh, than the mass of, of the electron. You can't do this for electric fields because if you crank up the electric field too far, you'll turn on poles uh, in this action associated with on-shell production. 
but if you have a constant magnetic field, it's still consistent to evaluate uh, the uh, F, to the, F to the N Euler-Heisenberg action well outside the standard EFT regime. And what you find is that it goes like, uh, delta L goes like B to the fourth at very, very small B, which you expect, it's the, it's the standard uh, F to the fourth terms. But even at huge B, B much larger than M, uh, you find a convex positive action that actually goes like B squared asymptotically. And this is what causality and unitarity are doing for you, demanding positivity of the action. So we believe that most well-defined actions are going to have delta L strictly positive, uh, which will give us uh, positive delta zeta. I wanna do uh, another example here where I can connect it to techniques from scattering amplitudes. Great, great. So let me take a grab. Yeah, let me yeah. ask a naive question that just you triggered in something you said. So, I mean, if, if you can evaluate this at very large magnetic field, um, yeah. why can't you, why don't you automatically know what it must be for large electric fields simply by, I don't know, Lorentz invariance. I mean, the only combination that can appear here is presumably either E dot B or E squared minus B squared. So what stops you from simply- Yeah. Um, e squared? No, I, I, I think you're actually, well, okay. All, all I mean by you can't evaluate this is that this, this integral expression uh, is not well defined at arbitrarily large electric field just because it has poles. Um, and physically what's happening is if I, so the, the EFT breaks at large electric field in a way that it doesn't at large magnetic field, just because if I, if I integrated out something that's electrically charged and I crank the electric field up uh, arbitrarily large, I ultimately will be you know, pair producing uh, electrons and positrons out of vacuum in a way that I'm not doing when I crank up the B field. Uh, yeah, no, I agree with that. But just to, purely at the level of, I mean, if you can- Oh, at, at the level of Lorentz invariance, sure. If you knew the full functional form um, at, you know, at E equals zero, uh, but in, in B space, you could probably, uh, you could probably infer uh, some of the structure of, of this just by, uh, yeah, just by the objects that have to appear, yeah. Okay. But, but also probably you don't really want to crank it up arbitrarily large because well eventually one expects for inconsistent theory that there will be also magnetic monopoles right so for the argument you well, don't need to right take... i mean if you go non-perturbatively large or something yeah yeah right but i mean you you can take b larger than one uh larger than one in in m squared units is is all that i need yeah yeah okay uh good so uh, I wanted to give the example of, of Riemann to the fourth terms uh, because there's a very nice uh, story with uh, analyticity and causality that uh, one can tell here. So consider Einstein Maxwell plus Riemann to the fourth. Uh, in, in four dimensions, there are exactly two uh, R to the fourth operators that are independent. It's RR squared and RR dual squared uh, with two Wilson coefficients, uh, they'll write as C and C tilde. Now you can compute two to two graviton scattering uh, there are two graviton uh, modes. Uh, the, I can write them as the plus polarization and cross polarization and define theta as just the angle between the two admixtures. And I can scatter two to two graviton scattering. And depending on whether I scatter two of the same polarization or two of the opposite polarization, I turn on either C or C tilde. And you can show through standard dispersion relation techniques that S to the N where N is even um, in the forward amplitude has to have positive uh, coefficient. So uh, analyticity and unitarity uh, require that both C and C tilde are positive. Now, there are issues with applying this to uh, the four derivative terms, the R squared term because of uh, T channel singularities in the amplitude, but these nicely don't apply uh, to sufficiently high derivative operators. So one gets uh, just by analyticity and unitarity positivity of these Wilson coefficients. And indeed, uh, Matt uh, has previously shown that the same conclusion can be reached by demanding uh, subluminality of the gravitons in various backgrounds. So causality also says the same thing here. But we can now ask, what do these operators do to, uh, to our Q over M ratio? Now, you know it should be positive because, uh, because of that nice expression I derived a few slides ago, that delta zeta should go like uh, delta L. But we can test this, and this is an important sanity check. We can, we can compute delta Q over M in a totally different way. Uh, so let's actually just compute the explicit corrected metric corrected by these Riemann to the fourth terms. And there are techniques for doing that. And we can, we can explicitly uh, solve it. And, and it's given by the following somewhat horrible expression. 
But importantly, from this, we can extract what is the bound on the charge to mass ratio of the black hole. And we get by explicit computation that delta Q over M extremal is uh, a positive number times C, which by analyticity and unitarity is positive. And we get the same exact thing if we use our uh, delta zeta equals delta L expression. And that expression uh, allows us to do more, allows us to compute uh, delta zeta for even a spinning black hole. And we get the following. And since both C and C tilde are positive, indeed, we find that delta zeta is positive for arbitrary spin, for non-spinning extremal charge black holes, all the way to uh, spinning neutral extremal Kerr black holes and everything in between. Again, I'm asking, you, so at least some of these uh, Wilson coefficients in front of high dimensional operators, they also they exhibit log running, right? So yes. when you say that, so at what scale you're working here when you say they're, they're positive? Oh, good, right? okay, I'm, I'm super glad you asked this. I was gonna mention this at the end of the talk. So if you, um, okay, if you think back to that Q over M plot, Q over M versus M, there are sort of three different regimes. One regime is up in the UV where nobody can say anything unless you assume a particular UV completion. The, the second regime is, uh, you know, within, within a couple orders of magnitude of the UV scale, but below it. So like the, the threshold regime, you could call that, where the dominant uh, contribution to the Wilson coefficients comes from just the constant values that you get from integrating out uh, the, the massive states. But then there's the sort of asymptotic regime. If you go uh, exponentially far uh, to large mass black holes, so very, very small curvatures uh, probing the extreme infrared, then indeed uh, log running will dominate. And um, in fact, at extremely low curvatures, extremely low energies, uh, your action will be dominated by the T mu nu squared operator. You can, you can show this. And so here, uh, actually, this is in, in research that uh, Nima and Yutin and I are, are currently working on. Um, you can compute the beta function uh, for, for this operator by just doing the, the uh, by using standard analyticity techniques and by doing the, the on-shell cut of a, of a bubble diagram. And you can find, uh, is the beta function positive or negative for various uh, massless states that you've integrated out like the graviton or the photon or even uh, in supersymmetric theories, uh, gravitinos. And the beta function is always negative, uh, which means that it goes, that, that the operator gets larger and larger in the IR, unless you are in sufficiently, su uh, sufficiently supersymmetric theory, the gravitinos can cancel, uh, can cancel the contribution and give you exactly zero beta function. But it can never go uh, the other way. It can never be a positive beta function and run to negative delta Z uh, at, at very, very large mass. It always, it always gets better. And that sort of makes sense. Any theory that uh, sort of satisfies these self-sufficiency and uh, self-consistency conditions at some energy scale should continue to do so at lower and lower energy scales. And that fixes the sign of the beta function to be uh, in, the, in the right direction. But so the arguments which you're presenting, do they, have, because from that point of view, kind of it looks the most interesting regime in the very UV, right? Where this science really probe UV completion, because then right. if one goes to IR and gets positive contribution, it's kind of swamps, swamps everything, right? So these constraints yeah, you're yeah. presenting, do they apply in that very UV regime or? I mean, they, they, they apply, well, okay. They, they don't apply above the scale of uh, the stuff that you've integrated out. So let's, let's say that the mass that, let, let's say we're talking about the four derivative operators and I'm integrating out uh, some, uh, some state at mass M phi. Uh, so these operators will go like one over M phi squared, uh, the Wilson coefficient. So one over M phi squared times some order one number plus log. Um, you know, it's it's in the regime where the logs aren't aren't log aren't large. That it's interesting. So within within you know a few orders of magnitude below uh, below the mass of the UV completion, but not you know exponentially below the mass of the UV completion. So is there some assumption here about UV completion being weakly coupled? Mm, not not that I've made yet. Uh, ultimately, I'll have some things to say about weak coupling assumptions, but not not that I've made yet. Um, okay. And also I should note that the, the fundamental relationship that we derive, the delta Q over M equals delta L equals delta S, uh, that applies regardless of what the higher dimension operators are generated by, whether they're generated by loops or by uh, you know, 
massive states at tree level or massive states at loop level or log running or whatever, uh, it, it doesn't matter. That is an EFT that is, is true EFT holds. Okay, good. So uh, now I wanna, I wanna look at another example that kind of elucidates a little bit more of, uh, of the subtlety of what can happen uh, with some of the higher derivative terms. So what about terms of mixed order in derivatives? So for concreteness, uh, let me consider quartic operators, but of different order. So f to the fourth, uh, the famous Euler-Heisenberg, leading Euler-Heisenberg terms that go like s squared in their amplitudes and can be bounded to be positive. Uh, the r to the fourth terms that we just thought about, which we, one can also bound. And something in between, an r squared f squared term, whose amplitudes go like momentum to the sixth and can't be bounded because the forward amplitudes uh, vanish. Now, if the f to the fourth terms dominate, they'll give delta q over m is positive. Similarly, if the r to the fourth terms dominate. But one could ask, is there some intermediate regime uh, where the r squared f squared operators of indefinite sign can never spoil positivity? So let me uh, write down an example uh, completion where I have just some massive uh, scalar phi coupled to r squared and f squared. So here, epsilon is some uh, tunable parameter. If epsilon is order one, then f to the fourth dominates and we're fine. Uh, if epsilon is, is zero or extremely small, then r to the fourth dominates and we also get positive q over m. But one could a priori wonder, is there some intermediate regime in epsilon where delta q over m could uh, take the wrong uh, sign? So we integrate out phi, uh, we get an action that's a perfect square. And so of course, given our delta L equals delta Q over M relation, we'll, we'll get positive uh, delta Z, positive delta Q over M. But this is again, another nice check uh, of that formula that we derived using Euclidean quantum gravity that we can compute, uh, just compute straightforwardly uh, from the metric, uh, what is the delta Q over M for this action. So we do that. And we get, as we expected, some terms that are positive definite that come from f to the fourth or r to the fourth. But we get terms that look like uh, they're of ambiguous sign because these come from the r squared f squared uh, operators. Here, mu is a parameter that tells me uh, whether my black hole is, is electric or magnetic. Mu equals one is electric, mu equals minus one is magnetic. But all of these terms can be rearranged into a sum of perfect squares. So into something that's manifestly positive. And this agrees precisely with what we get from our delta zeta equals delta L formula. So it's yet another check of that formula. All right, um, finally, I wanna tell you why you should think that delta S is positive, why the entropy itself uh, should shift upward, independent of the sort of unitarity and causality um, motivation I gave for why delta L should be positive. So, Go back to thermodynamics, consider two systems with the same macrostate, but different types of microstate. The system on the right has some extra degrees of freedom, some extra microstates I've represented by, by the shade of the color. So the system on the right obviously has greater entropy. It has extra modes. And we can apply the same thing to our, our black hole system. We can, we can expect the system on the right, the system in the theory of L plus delta L to have greater entropy. So that's the motivation. Let's uh, actually prove it. So for the purposes of this proof, I'm going to assume some very specific things about the UV completion. I'll assume that there exist quantum fields phi at some mass scale m phi uh, far below the scale at which QFT breaks down. So uh, lambda might be the string scale, if you like. And lambda could be much smaller than the Planck scale if we're in a weakly coupled uh, theory. Uh, I'll further assume that the fields phi couple to photons and gravitons such that the higher dimension operators are generated at tree level. Uh, so like phi r or phi f squared. Now phi need not be a scalar. I'm just suppressing Lorentz indices. It could be phi mu nu, r mu nu, or phi mu nu rho sigma, r mu nu rho sigma, et cetera. Uh, couplings like this are common in string theory. Uh, the dilaton and moduli are massless in the SUSY limit. They like to couple to things like this and they acquire masses when SUSY is broken. Uh, we'll further choose our charges and uh, spins to consider black holes that are thermodynamically stable in the path integral. And what I mean by that is uh, black holes with positive heat capacity. So you can compute the heat capacity and uh, you can demand uh, positive heat capacity and further positive isothermal moment of inertia. So the isothermal moments of inertia are just d angular momentum, d omega. And so requiring all positive eigenvalues of this tensor and positive uh, capacity, we get some 
particular choices of charges and spins. So that is, we want extremal black holes that aren't, that they're more towards the extremal charge side than they are to the extremal uh, curve side. And this, this will guarantee that the black hole uh, is thermodynamically stable in the path integral so that there aren't physical negative modes that it can run away to. So let's return to that Euclidean path integral at fixed uh, t and omega. Sorry, and we'll uh, yeah. Grant, I don't understand. In the path integral, though, there is always the, uh, say, the dilatation mode, like the- uh, Yes, I, I, was gonna, I was gonna mention that. So um, that's right. Uh, but, so there are two things to say about that. One is that you can, you can decompose the metric into, into the dilatation mode, and you can do that you, you, can, you can integrate over that mode on, on a separate contour and you can show that it's different than like than the physical modes that are there that are associated with thermodynamic instabilities. So the Schwarzschild black hole has, for example, this famous dilatation mode, the, the conformal mode that uh, has uh, that, that can uh, lead you to a negative runaway direction. But there are, a, there are additional modes that are associated with the fact that Schwarzschild has negative heat capacity. And similarly for Reissner Nordstrom, uh, you can show that there that any time that there are physical, as in modes that can't be separated in in the way that Hawking and friends separated the conformal mode, there are, that where there are physical negative modes, they're always associated with uh, negative uh, heat capacity or negative isothermal moment of inertia. So yeah, there there will be a slide on that, but good point. So what I'm all I'm doing right now is I'm integrating back in the UV. I'm writing the path integral uh, with uh, the phi field. So I have IUV as my UV action, and it generates my uh, EFT action uh, by definition in, in the usual way. So on shell, crucially, on shell, phi is not zero, since the equations of motion will drag phi to of order r or f squared, uh, since, since phi is generating these uh, higher curvature terms at tree level. Now, a math fact that we'll use is the observation that if I take the UV Euclidean action, evaluate it with phi pin to zero uh, off shell, that just gives me uh, the effective action in pure Einstein-Maxwell theory evaluated on that same metric and gauge field configuration, just by definition. But this is a nice fact because it allows us to compare the two black hole entropies in two different theories by trading two different theories for working in a single theory with the cost being uh, com comparing on shell versus off shell field configurations. So that's what we'll do. So now we're gonna to put together a string of equalities to prove what we want. Uh, so by definition of delta i, I can write delta i as uh, i evaluated on the correct solution minus i bar evaluated on the solution in uncorrected Einstein-Maxwell. By the saddle point approximation, I can replace i with i u v. Uh, with phi evaluated on the solution. I can replace I bar with I U V with phi evaluated at zero. And then this will be negative if the saddle point of the solution uh, is a local minimum. So that is if I've chosen a black hole with positive heat capacity and moment of inertia such that none of the physical uh, potentially negative modes get turned on, uh, which is the case if I, if I choose uh, my charges correctly. And in that case, we know that delta i is minus delta s, so delta s is positive then for tree level completions. And this accords, as I said, with our intuition that integrating out extra massive QFT degrees of freedom should increase the black hole's entropy. And to Massimo's point, uh, yes, indeed, there are conformal saddle point instabilities, but one, could, one can separate those out in the path integral. This has been uh, shown in detail in the literature by Gibbons, Hawking, Perry, and later uh, others for, for the charged black hole, and this is, this is understood. So now that we've argued that delta S is positive, and that indeed for tree level completions, uh, we'll then have delta Q over M automatically positive. Uh, so thereby getting the weak gravity conjecture automatically. We can, we can go back uh, to Sergey's question from earlier in the talk and ask, what does this allow us to concretely say about the Wilson coefficients uh, themselves? So our uh, delta S is positive bound. Um, first, our delta S is positive bound along with our delta zeta equals delta L relation implies that all the black holes in this barrel-shaped region, all the extremal black holes in, in most of this spheroid, can decay directly to other thermodynamic 
uh, can decay directly to other black holes uh, that are nearly at rest. So black holes with spin can decay directly to other uh, spinning uh, black holes that you know, are not in a large angular momentum state that are nearly at rest with respect to, with respect to the others. So it's kind of a principle of black hole self-sufficiency, uh, if you like. And for charged black holes without spin, we've, we've proven the weak gravity conjecture in theories with tree level UV completions. And through our discussion of delta L and unitarity, we've suggested why it should be true uh, even in, in greater generality. But right, let's, let's return to those uh, four derivative uh, corrections in Einstein-Maxwell theory, uh, C1 through C8, and we'll use the delta S's positive condition to get a family of positivity bounds on the CIs. So for convenience, I'm going to rescale the CIs with various powers of the, of the Planck mass so that all the CIs have the same uh, dimensions. They'll all be of order one over M5 squared. Now, sorry, so my mask yeah. it's, it's a related question, but I'm just really trying to understand it because you know, for leading a relevant operator, there is no log running. And that's why, so the constraint on this sign of that operator is really constrained on the physical amplitude. One can formulate it without referring to any operators, any Wilson coefficients. You take a physical amplitude, expand it in S, leading term S squared, and that coefficient should be positive. So for yeah. the sub-leading sub high dimensional operators, there is log running, meaning this log, which meaning this Wilson coefficients, they're really not unambiguously defined. There is always some scheme ambiguities and they can be shifted by constants, which suggests that it would be strange if I could get really sharp bound on that. So that well, there is some- even, Well, but wait, wait a minute, even, even the leading, even the leading guy uh, log runs. So you can- um, No, no, uh, no, 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 not in device. T mu, I, I in, mean, T mu nu squared, T, T mu nu, T mu nu log runs. Well, in DeFi, at least in this simplest example of scalar field, like DeFi to the four term doesn't doesn't log run. Oh no, right? DeFi the DeFi the four. But I'm saying in Einstein Maxwell theory, T mu nu squared runs. Right. So yeah. So but that, but that's what I'm trying to say. So whenever there is log running, there is implicit there is implicit ambiguity. Really, what what even one means by the Wilson coefficient because it's scheme dependent, right? You, so is there was there well, some in, implicit choice of scheme which is being done here when you get the sharp bound? Yeah, or? yeah. So so yes. So so in 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 essence, you're asking about because I, I talked about the two regimes of kind of the threshold regime and the asymptotic regime, and you're asking about you know what about between. So this is something we have not yet uh, have not yet spelled out uh, completely, um, but. Yeah, so, so what, what one can unambiguously say is that the threshold corrections themselves are positive when the logs are small and that the logs are positive uh, when they dominate. But in between, it, it, in between it's, scheme, it's scheme dependent and you can't really say anything, uh, I think. So that's I mean, these constraints are different from the constraint for the leading operator where, where there's yeah, no well, one. That one is really constraint right. of physical yeah. amplitude and these are- that's, that's right, yeah, yeah. But, but what I'm talking about now are well, what I'm talking about for now are the physical amplitude constraints. I mean, these are these are leading constraints. These are, you know, if these go like one over m squared, these are these are uh, Wilson coefficients that care about what's the coupling of phi to r squared or the coupling of phi to f squared. Uh, so yep. I'm for for now I'm interested in the threshold regime. Yeah. But um, an, another point of ambiguity about the Wilson coefficients is that each Wilson coefficient on its own is not physically meaningful. Uh, and again, it's only the combinations that show up in amplitudes that are physically meaningful. If someone says to you, uh, you know, what's, I, I have a theory of quantum gravity and it gives me this uh, number for the Wilson coefficient of R squared, that's not meaningful on its own because nature doesn't care what we call things. So we can shift G mu nu by delta G mu nu, where delta G mu nu is you know, R mu nu or G mu nu R or F mu nu squared. And here these are one, two, three, four are arbitrary numbers. And this has the effect of shifting the action or equivalently uh, the net effect of shifting the higher dimension oper operator coefficients uh, among each other by, by various uh, linear combinations of the Rs. So it's only the linear combination that's uh, completely R one, two, three, four independent that's uh, physically meaningful. And there are four such combinations that I'll label D naught, D three, D six, and D nine. So D naught and D nine are sort of like the two F to the fourth uh, operators after field redefinition. Uh, D3 is the Gauss-Binet uh, Gauss operator and D6 is Riemann F squared. So the entropy shift uh, will be automatically field redefinition invariant and hence it will be built out of uh, these three or these four uh, coefficients. 
And we can compute what, what's the entropy shift for a rotating dionic black hole. And it's the following. Here, xi is that extremality parameter that's zero for an extremal uh, black hole. And so self-consistency of black hole entropy demands positivity of delta s for arbitrary, uh, arbitrary parameters in, in the in this regime that we've stated. So it's a three-parameter family on uh, all consistent corrections to Einstein-Maxwell. But in fact, through numerical testing, we find the strongest bounds actually come from the non-spinning black holes. So we actually have a, we can reduce this to a two-parameter family of bounds on d0, d3, d6, and d9. So we can check this uh, in various ways. We can check uh, this, this set of bounds by, for example, uh, computing delta s in two different ways, uh, either, either directly through our uh, delta s equals delta action or by computing the corrected metric and computing the walled entropy. We can furthermore compute the temperature in two different ways. We can differentiate, differentiate the walled entropy or just compute the surface gravity from the corrected metric. And we again find agreement. We can also uh, impose electromagnetic uh, duality. So swapping F and F dual uh, has the effect of redefining the Wilson coefficients among each other, or equivalently of swapping Q and Q tilde, the electric and magnetic charges. And we again get, uh, get agreement that our, our entropy shift respects electromagnetic duality. So let's, let's see what we get for the bounds. So we can plug in some numbers, uh, at, that is plug in explicit types of black holes and see what they tell us. So plugging in various types of extremal black holes uh, with different dionic charges, we get that D naught is positive and D9 is positive. And if I turn off all the operators that contain uh, gravitons, and if I reduce this to just the F to the fourth terms, these two bounds become the two bounds that you get from analyticity of uh, four photon scattering through the Euler-Heisenberg terms. So that's, that's a nice uh, sanity check of this as well. So uh, I'll color code what kinds of black holes rule out what. So blue is magnetic, yellow is electric, and black is a uh, short shield. So we can bound D3. We can bound the, the Gauss-Binet uh, coefficient. So D3 can't get too negative relative to D0 and D9. And this, this accords with the, the fact that we, we suspect that D3 is positive anyway. Uh, we gave a unitarity argument uh, in this paper for positivity of D3. So various types of black holes or superpositions of the bounds from different types of black holes rules out uh, some of the parameter space of, of the uh, Gauss-Binet coefficient. Finally, the, the infamous D6 operator. Uh, this operator is banned in supersymmetric theories. It's the Riemann F squared operator. And what we find is that it also can't be too big relative to D0 and D9. Uh, if D0 and D9 are generated by some QFT state at scale m phi, then what one finds is that D6 can't be much bigger than 1 over m phi squared. And how we got these bounds is by marginalizing over all possible uh, dionic parameters, mar marginalizing over a, a mixture of electric and magnetic black holes. And this, the, this fact that D6 can't be too large uh, accords with another conclusion that Camaño, Maldacena, uh, and, and friends found from causality. So this is the bound space that's ruled out there. Uh, and all sorts of different types of dionic black holes play a role from magnetic, fr from magnetic all the way to electric. Good. Uh, finally, uh, another check is some example UV completions. And we can UV complete all these operators with either integrating in a scalar, a pseudoscalar, uh, some tensor like a massive graviton coupled to T mu nu, or even uh, read off the Wilson coefficients of the heterotic string. And in all, all of these cases, all of these tree level completions, we find that delta S is indeed manifestly positive um, as, as we uh, expected from, from our proof. So just in the, in the last couple of minutes here, uh, I'll sort of reiterate what we found uh, in this talk. We've, we've discovered a new fundamental property of black holes that relates the shift in the extremality and the on-shell effective action. Uh, and we found that uh, fundamental property using uh, the black hole entropy shift, delta S. So it's this beautiful uh, formula here that I showed earlier relating delta Q over M, delta S, and delta L. For, we further motivated the expectation that delta L is positive using unitarity. And we computed the positive externality shift in theories with various types of operators, r to the fourth, f squared, r squared, f to the fourth. And we found that it always agreed uh, with our prediction. We further argued using self-consistency of black hole thermodynamics that delta S should be positive in any tree level UV completion. That is the threshold cor correction to delta S should be positive. So why is the weak gravity conjecture true? 
Well, it's true because it turns out that unitarity of QFT in the, in the form of demanding positivity of delta L and consistency of black hole thermodynamics, which demands positivity of delta S, are both saying the same thing. Quantum, uh, quantum field theory and quantum gravity are telling us the same thing, and they're telling us that uh, black hole decay is self-sufficient in the sense that charged and spinning black holes can just decay to other charged and spinning black holes. And we applied our bound uh, to dionic uh, and spinning black holes to constrain the Wilson coefficients in uh, the four derivative EFT, as we saw. Now, there's various uh, directions of ongoing work that I alluded to in this talk. Uh, one perhaps surprising thing is if we do this same uh, computation, but for GHS black holes in string theory, so uh, dilatonic black holes, which are very different from Reissner and Nordstrom, uh, they're, they're quite different in that they're, they have zero size when they're extremal. We nonetheless find that they still satisfy our delta Q over M equals delta L relation, even though the way that we prove that only works for uh, Kernuman black holes. So there's something even deeper going on that the shift in extremality goes like the shift in the action. Uh, another uh, direction of current research involves the running of couplings, computing these uh, beta functions for the T mu squared operator by computing these cuts uh, with various intermediate states like gravitons or uh, uh, gauge fields or, or gravitinos. And finally, the, the central role that the on-shell action uh, played in the weak gravity conjecture is really suggestive that the, maybe the on-shell action is something we should think about more. And in fact, in another direction, uh, in another paper that we're currently working on, one can show, for example, that uh, various interacting theories whose on-shell actions are total derivatives, like uh, general relativity, any theory with a dilaton, or even the uh, low energy action or in their so uh, finally, there's a lot of interesting future directions that one can pursue. Uh, the connection between the A theorem and the black hole entropy shift. That is, you know, if you if you compute the entropy shift passing through various mass shells, right, it'll be positive for each one. So it seems like delta S of the black hole should maybe behave like some kind of A theorem parameter. Um, let me see. If I, no, one second. There we go. Um, another another interesting idea to pursue would be extended versions of the weak gravity conjecture, like the the tower weak gravity conjecture. Um, Perhaps we can derive other swampland bounds from black hole thermodynamics, like, uh, like the distance conjecture or even the Sitter conjecture. That would be interesting to think about. Uh, other connections to phenomenology. Um, we've thought, uh, my collaborators and I have thought recently about uh, you know, how one can bound the standard model EFT using analyticity. It would be interesting to connect that to what, what, do, what does adding D Higgs to the fourth operators, for example, do to, uh, do to a black hole. But, so there's a lot of interesting future directions. But the takeaway is that the IR consistency program really represents an amazing new bridge between low and high energy physics, uh, between particle physics and string theory, between QFT and quantum gravity. Um, it allows us to uh, predict and shape what we expect uh, the, the allowed space of effective field theories is. And it, it puts together in a new and interesting way really bedrock principles from both field theory and gravity, including, as we've seen in this talk, uh, unitarity and black hole thermodynamics. So thanks again very much, and I'm happy to take any, uh, any other questions. Thank you very much for your talk. Yes, please do ask, especially our graduate students, but not. Can I ask, you, you probably already mentioned that so this delta Q over M relation to delta L, does it apply if one replaces Q by J, by, by the spin? Oh, and, yeah, and... yeah. So, so um, yes. So let me see. Uh, let me back way up and uh, remind you of the definitions here for the charges. Yeah, so here I've defined this extremality parameter zeta. Zeta is just adding in quadrature the electric charge, the uh, magnetic charge, and the A parameter, which is J over M. So what we showed is that delta zeta equals delta L. Yeah, so, so it, applies, it applies to the, to the spin in the same way as, as the charge. And what is because there there is no weak gravity conjecture. Right, so. there, there there's no weak gravity conjecture. So but uh -huh. what, what it tells you is if delta zeta is positive, 
then if I have some extremal Kerr black hole that's not charged and just spinning, then if, if delta zeta is positive, then that, uh, then that object can decay to other spinning objects that are at rest with respect to the original. It doesn't need to throw its angular momentum into uh, large orbital angular momentum of the decay products. Um, it, can, it can sort of just decay to other spinning states at rest um, in, in the same way. So yeah, it, it's, you know, that didn't have to be true from any uh, fundamental standpoint, but this is what I meant by a sort of principle of black hole self-sufficiency in decay. Like the black holes can decay to other black holes uh, that are at rest, rest without having to use, you know, um, the orbital angular momentum of gravitons, for example, that they could throw off to shed angular momentum. Yeah. Could I ask Grant, on, on your second to last slide, the, the last sort of bullet point, um, there was an internet glitch, which may have just affected me. I don't know, but I couldn't uh, couldn't hear what you were saying about the uh, not, not on, here. Yeah, here. Yeah, this this project with with Nima here at the bottom. Oh yeah, so so I can I can describe this a little more. Um, so there are various theories whose total whose whose on shell actions are total derivatives. So if you plug in the equations of motion into the action, the action vanishes up to a total derivative. Um, obviously. Uh, a free theory will do this, but that's not interesting. But GR does this, R equals zero on shell. Um, uh, any theory with a dilaton coupling, so either the, either the phi times an action where that action only depends on the derivative of phi will do that. But it won't do that if you have a coupling that goes like some other function other than e to the phi. So this is a special feature of the dilaton coupling. Interestingly and non-trivially, the supergravity action does this, and one has to do some work in order to massage the action into a total derivative form using the equations of motion. But it's only special theories uh, that satisfy this property. And it's interesting, it, I mean, we, we got thinking about this because of the importance of the on-shell action in, in proving the weak gravity conjecture, as I, as I showed in this talk. So this is sort of tangentially connected, but it's, it's the statement that the on-shell action has other interesting properties that are worth exploring that can maybe shed some light on things that were previously mysterious. For example, the, the dilaton coupling, the exponential form of the dilaton coupling. If you're an effective field theorist, that looks super tuned, right? And normally uh, one would like to explain that using some symmetry and there isn't really uh, one for the dilaton coupling. And this is something that, for example, has bothered Nima for years. So he was really excited to see that we could show that uh, it follows from just demanding this total derivative property. Um, another, another comment I would make is that this is another route to arrive at GR. So for example, if one wants to write down an action that's built out of uh, some two Lorentz index field and that has uh, two derivatives, that's second order in derivatives, and if you don't assume anything about, uh, about the metric, you just say, I have the Minkowski metric and I have some object h mu nu and I'll construct an arbitrary action. One can show that GR follows almost uniquely by simply imposing uh, this total derivative on shell property uh, on the Lagrangian. So without assuming unitarity or ghost free or any of the usual routes to driving GR uniquely, this is another uh, route towards that. Thank you. Other questions? So, so may I ask a general question? Uh, Please. Yeah. I don't see anything, say, special to string theory in this derivation. I mean, it seems to apply to a I mean, your, your bounds follow from unitarity, causality, but there is nothing, for instance, that uh, would yeah, be that's special right. that would uh, be due to, I don't know, some regular behavior, et cetera. So, right, yeah. That's, that's absolutely right. So, so, but what I've said in this talk does not exhaust all possibilities uh, for saying things from, from the IR. And, and a dream of the IR consistency program would be to drive the Reggie trajectory. Uh, would, would, be to, would be to show that uh, the unique way one can UV complete uh, the graviton amplitude is through something that has a Reggie trajectory. Uh, there, there have been a couple papers sort of beginning to point in that direction, but it's, it's, it's still an open question. Um, yeah, Th this is why this is exciting though, I think. The, the fact that we've seen in this example that 
string theory and the IR both are saying essentially the same thing about the boundary of the swampland. Um, gives us hope that maybe using these techniques, we can say more and eventually maybe even derive the full uh, swampland and even the full structure of string theory using um, approaches that are relatively agnostic about the UV. I mean, one would hope that that's true if string theory is, is somehow unique, right? So. Thank you. Uh, any question from our graduate students, for instance? In the meantime, I have one. So, so on the second bullet point here, um, mm -hmm. so with regarding the log running with the negative beta function. So, you, so you've you've applied these positivity bounds to other theories as well, right? Where do, do you have? I mean, does running complicate things there in other situations? Like in let's say your standard model EFT papers, for example, is it right. always? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, Right. If I was if I was giving my my standard model EFT talk, I would have nice diagrams to show you. But I can I can uh, I can hand wave and explain. Um, so yeah, in in fact, one can use these techniques to bound both the threshold correction and the beta function in uh, in in the standard model EFT, for example. And all that's happening is if if you know how those dispersion relation bounds work, you start off with a small contour. At near, near the origin in the complex S plane, so at small energy, right? And then you ultimately deform that into a contour that's running up and down uh, the positive and negative real S axis. And you're, you're writing the Wilson coefficient in terms of a discontinuity in the amplitude, which gives you the cross section. But, and, and, and you have some big contour at infinity that vanishes. But I don't need to place my two contours, one at the origin and one at infinity. I can do something intermediate. I can place one contour at some energy scale and the other contour at some other energy scale. And all that tells me is that the difference in the effective Wilson coefficients at the large energy scale and the small energy scale can be written as, as an integral over a cross section over some finite part of, of, the, uh, of the energy axis. And all that's telling you is, is the beta function in effect uh, because one, one uh, contour will extract the effective coefficient at one energy and the other contour will extract the effective coefficient at some other energy. Thanks. In, uh, in the, this, the assumption that in your dispersive integrals the contour at infinity vanishes is an assumption, right? I mean, it's a... Right, that, that's an assumption and, and crucial. That's, that's not something I used in this talk, but it's, it's an assumption that for some theories can be proved uh, if, if, you're, if, you're, are, if you are scattering massive states and if you are bounding uh, operators that are sufficiently high in derivatives, one can use the Frasar bound to uh, get the uh, contour at infinity will vanish. If you're scattering massless states, uh, then one has to be a little more careful, but how would that work in the presence of gravity? Because I mean, if well, right in, in in the presence in the right in the presence of gravity, one cannot use one cannot use this. I um, for for the standard model EFT, one one can use one can use Frasart to get rid of the contour at infinity. In in gravity, one has to assume that it vanishes, and it is an assumption, um, but it's a relatively weak assumption. Uh, I I think of it philosophically like this: if the contour at infinity doesn't vanish, that means that that amplitude at large momentum scales uh, the same with momentum as, as, the, as the naive EFT amplitude uh, at, small, at small energies. Um, and what that means is that then the, the UV completion is sort of not doing its job in, in the sense of it's not making the amplitude any more perturbatively unitary than it already was. I mean, that, that's possible that that could be true, but certainly in, in most well-defined examples that we have, for example, from string theory, uh, the amplitude is, is well-behaved at, at large momentum. I yeah, suppose that the worry that many have is that it, it, though the amplitudes in physical regions behave well, the analytic structure in the complex plane is a bit uh, a guess. Oh, right, that's, that, that's another, well, right. Uh, so 
this again is not something I'm using in this talk, but uh, you're, you're absolutely right that in dispersion relation arguments, one has to further assume that uh, the amplitude it has the same analytic properties at, at large energy as, uh, as, as it does at small energies. And for gravity, that's, that is an assumption. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have all other questions for Grant? Well, I'd ask one, but it's uh, very naive as usual. Um, That's totally fine. So, it's, uh, so clearly there's a great motivation to just understand the formal properties of theories and, and you know, what's really well constrained and, and so on. But you know, thinking down the line, like five or 10 years away, what do you think are the real goals of, what kind of things can emerge from this? Would it really help you understand, for example, um, why we appear to not live in any disorder space or something like that. <laughs> you know, I mean, so so I think I think there are even possible phenomenological connections between this story and uh, and you know future physics, say five years uh, from now. So this was this was a story I didn't have time to tell in this talk, but there are there have been attempts. In fact, I've I've written papers on this, uh, connecting the weak gravity conjecture to uh, even the hierarchy problem. Um, so, so here, let, let me sketch out the, the idea for you. Suppose that um, we add to the standard model uh, the right-handed neutrinos, and suppose those neutrinos are charged under an unbroken U1b minus L. So this is a fifth force that people search for. Um, the gauge coupling could be ridiculously small. If it's like you know 10 to the minus 20, 10 to the minus 30 gauge coupling, we wouldn't have seen it yet. But actually, well, 10 to the minus 20 we might have seen. We wouldn't have seen 10 to the minus 30 yet. But we're getting close. Uh, this is, but interestingly, then under an unbroken U1b B minus L, the the lightest neutrino would be the weak gravity state. Um, if it's if it's not a black hole, right? Uh, the the lightest neutrino would be the state with the largest charge to mass ratio under under such a force. So then if we ask, keeping the Yukawas fixed, could the weak scale have been larger than its present value? Um, if the charge is sufficiently small, if the gauge coupling is sufficiently small, then the weak gravity conjecture would tell you the answer is no. So you can end up getting quantum gravity enforced fine tunings of this sort uh, via you know, fairly straightforward particle physics models. And so, I think that the goal of understanding what's the space of allowed theories has the potential to really surprise us with, I mean, it's, it's more broadly the, the lesson that quantum gravity sometimes breaks our normal intuition about UV and IR disconnection, right? There, there can be interesting things that the UV tells us about the IR that, that, that really could impact physics in the next five to 10 years. So, so that's just one example off the top of my head. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Any other? Any other question? Any sort? Yes, I have a, I have a, an, an eight question and, and I'm not in the field, so maybe this is not okay. But we last week we, we listened talks, for example, uh, of a different, I mean there was a different approach to so calculating scatterings of graviton and called like celestial amplitudes. And they also like put uh, constraints on what are the, for example, the values of the co Wilson coefficients that will give us a UV action for gravity. And that is a super quantum mechanical calculation, like when scattering. And this one comes from more macroscopical properties of black holes. I mean, the constraints you can get can be in a certain agreement with quantum mechanical calculations of scattering, or, or, yeah. or, or there is no connection. No, no. So, so there, there is a connection. And in fact, um... Well, it's, it, there is a connection and it's a connection that's, that's still being understood. So even, let, let, let's take a simpler example uh, to, to illustrate the point. Uh, the, the, the F to the fourth um, interaction that, that I talked about in this talk a little bit. If F to the fourth is the only thing uh, that's, that's turned on, everything else is off, um, then indeed positivity of black hole entropy uh, will tell you that the F to the fourth coefficients are, are positive. 
But not only that, uh, classical causality will tell you that the f to the fourth coefficients have to be positive because you can compute the speed of photons in, in like a capacitor in, in such a theory. And you can, you can show that they'll go superluminal if you have the wrong signs of the Wilson coefficients. But also, you can do a quantum mechanical calculation. You can compute the two to two photon scattering amplitude, do the dispersion relation argument like we've been discussing, and, and write the Wilson coefficient as an integral of, of a cross section. And it'll also be positive. So these things always tend to point in the same direction. There are sometimes subtle differences, but yes, they always tend to be largely in agreement. That is not yet fully understood. Even the, even the connection between causality and the uh, dispersion relation calculation. So if I hand you an amplitude and I don't let you see the Lagrangian, I just give you some function of the Mandelstam variables um, and ask you, did this come from a causal theory? Uh, there does not yet exist a well-defined mechanism to answer that yes or no, given an arbitrary function of, uh, of Mandelstam variables. You can say no for certain functions, but in general, it, this is not understood. So yeah, it's, it's still somewhat mysterious why these things all point in the same direction. Other, I mean, it's, it's, it's a conspiracy of well-defined physics, uh, always, uh, always telling us the same lesson, but in different ways. But yeah, this is, this is something worth understanding. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, if we don't have any other questions, let me see. So we maybe we should thank uh, Grant uh, again for the very interesting talk and the uh, extensive discussion. So thank you very much. And, Thanks. Uh, thank you. Good. So. I'll end uh, now unless somebody wants to, uh, to continue the discussion. Okay. Thank you, Grant. All right. See you.